Hello again, friends. Uh, welcome to all of you who are here present with us this morning in person, as well as all of you watching online via our live stream on the internet, too. Welcome, welcome to you. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, as we learn more about your incredible devotion and love today, open up our hearts to receive all that you have done for us that our hearts might be filled to overflowing with love for you, for our Heavenly Father, and for each other. Bless us with your Holy Spirit and help us to apply to our own hearts and lives today those truths we see in your Holy Word. Well, in our, in our Bible story this morning, we're going to see the inspired writer Luke take us back in time to a quiet moment late one evening very soon before all hell is going to break loose. We find Jesus in a place that was very familiar to him and to his disciples because they went there often, in a place called the Garden of Gethsemane. Luke takes us close, close enough to hear the, the anguish in Jesus' voice as he's praying to his Father in heaven. But this is no mindless prayer. We get a little bit closer and we see on Jesus' face these drops of blood like sweat coming down his face as he prays more and more earnestly. We, we take in the whole thing. And what do we see? We see nothing less than the miracle of Christ's submission. We see the complete and total devotion of his love. We again see how his pain is our great gain. Hear the words from Luke chapter 22. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, Pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. When he rose from prayer and went back to the disciples, he found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. Why are you sleeping? He asked them. Get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. In this series, His Pain, Our Game, we've been, we've been seeing the really good news that the main message of the Bible is not, here's what you do for God. But rather, here's what God's Son, Jesus Christ, has done for you. That's really good news. But in these couple short verses, let's be honest, we also hear Jesus twice give a command to his, to his disciples, to his followers, about what they should do. Did you catch it? Twice Jesus says, pray so that you will not fall into temptation. And that sounds easy enough, doesn't it? It's not so hard to say those words. In fact, we say those words every Sunday when we come to church. And you probably say them every day in the Lord's Prayer when you pray that petition. Lead us not into temptation, right? You do pray that every day, right? <clears throat> if only it were that easy. Because don't you see yourself among Jesus' disciples. I know I do. Jesus tells them one simple thing. Pray so that you will not fall into temptation. And what do we find? What does Jesus find? He finds them asleep. Asleep in the hour of his greatest need when he needed them. They fell asleep. Well, understandable, you might say. Right? They, They've had a long week. 
They've been under a lot of stress lately. It's been a long day. Jesus has told them some hard truths, really sad things. They can't be expected to be fully devoted followers of Jesus when they're exhausted, right? Oh, do you recognize that temptation? It's really the temptation that's there for all of us, isn't it? Have you ever tempted to think to yourself, after all I've been through lately, I deserve to unwind a little bit in whatever way I choose. Or, as hard as I've worked lately, I've, I've earned the right to give in a little bit to whatever gratification of my own desires feels good. As exhausted as I feel, God will certainly understand if I need to cozy up to whatever my sinful nature desires for a little bit, right? With the cross that I've been carrying here for so long, now, now that it's spring break, I can take a little time out from being so fully devoted. I've been working so hard carrying out your will, God, now it's time for me and my will for change. Imagine, friends, if Jesus had adopted those kind of rationalizations. Imagine that. Jesus had prayed, Father, not your will, but my will be done. Imagine that Jesus had, had chosen his own personal gain rather than accepting the suffering and pain of the cross that he that he knew was before that what what would that mean for us? Well, to use the Bible's imagery here, that would mean that we would all have a cup to drink. A cup filled with the judgment of God's righteous anger over all this world's sin. I don't know about you, but I don't think that I consider very much the full fury of God's wrath over sin. I think if I did, I, I, I'd be a lot more aware and conscious of my own sin. I'd be a lot more eager to avoid it. I'd be a lot less willing to, to challenge God in the different areas of my life where I get frustrated sometimes. How about you? But then, but then here we, we see we see Jesus kneeling here in the garden, pleading, pleading with his father for another way, literally begging him not to pour out his wrath on him. And you think, could it really be that the father's wrath over sin is so furious that even the Son of God, according to his human nature, shrinks back from, from wanting to take it? It's no wonder, Jesus says, pray so that you will not fall into temptation. And yet it's right there when we hear Jesus speak those words. Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. Those words, those sweet, comforting words. Jesus didn't just say them, he embraced them. You know, he was just like us, so thoroughly human. Jesus would have been glad to be spared the suffering that he knew was coming to him, but only, only if that would be in keeping with his Father's will for our salvation. For that is the very reason that Jesus became incarnate took on our human flesh and blood so that he could carry away to the cross the sins of the world. And what, what comfort there is in all this, just, to, just that, that Jesus knows what it's like to be in a, in a place where he's just in anguish, right? That mentally, emotionally, he's just he's undone, he's distraught. Jesus knows what that's like. But even more comforting, 
is that Jesus completely submitted himself to the will of his Father, even when we haven't. What this meant for Jesus is that very soon Judas would show up, leading a detachment of Roman soldiers. Judas, he banked his entire plan on the fact that Jesus would be there. Think about it, there, doing what he was doing, praying. So devoted was Jesus to his Father's will. Imagine that people would know. Yeah, at such and such a time, you're going to be in such and such place because you're going to have a devotion. You're going to be praying. This is what you do. You're committed to following God and seeking his will. So what this meant also for Jesus, though, was the next thing. Going to the cross, where he would be in even more agony. Where he would be carrying the weight of all our sins where he would be drinking from the cup of God's wrath all the way down to the bottom. I was reminded of a hymn verse from that, the hymn, Stricken, Smitten, and Afflicted, you know, one of those minor key Lent hymns. And there's this verse that says, You who think of sin but lightly, and you you who think of sin but lightly, nor suppose the evil great. Here, well, it was at the cross. Here, may view its nature rightly. Here, its guilt may estimate. Mark the sacrifice appointed. See who bears the awful load. It's the word, the Lord's anointed, son of man and son of God. I can't really comprehend the trust that it would take to really embrace that prayer. Not my will, but yours be done. Not when it means going to a cross. Not when it means suffering for the sins of the world. I can't really comprehend that. And yet, it, it's still hard to embrace that prayer. Even when it means carrying far less heavy, painful crosses, right? It's not always that easy to submit our will to God's will in his word, is it? Uh, let's just talk, what does it mean to, to submit, right? That word came up earlier in, in one of our other Bible lessons, right? Ephesians 5. To submit simply means to yield my will to the will of another. To willingly yield my will to the will of another. When it comes to God, it means to pray, not my will, God, but yours be done in every aspect of our lives, whether that's our finances, or our family, or our sexuality, or our career, whatever vocations we're talking about. That's a very, very di different kind of prayer from what we might be tempted to think and pray sometimes, where we might go, hey, God, here's my plan, here's my will. Please bless it. And just say, no, if you don't, I might be a little bit perturbed, frustrated with you, push back and fight. If you don't. Right? I think, unfortunately, that's what a lot of people think Christianity is kind of all about. It's like going to God and saying, all right, God, you're going to bless me, right? You're going to make me happy, make my life comfortable, aren't you? And the thing is, nowhere does he say that. That's what he's there for. He never makes us that promise. It's kind of like the, the person who's drowning. Right? If you think about it, a person who's drowning, a lifeguard needs to pull someone ashore because, because they're drowning and they're in panic mode. So don't, don't fight against the lifeguard. Don't get frustrated with the lifeguard because you find yourself in a desperate situation. He's or she is there to help you. The lifeguard is there to rescue you you so too God is trying to pull you safely to the shore of heaven and when we fight against him it's never going to help that's why God doesn't promise that he's going to make our life comfortable and easy and happy in the sense we think of no challenges or problems but God says no you know when you face challenges when you go through trouble I'm going to be with you. I'm going to support you. I'm going to strengthen you. And I promise you that in the end, all things will work together for, the, for, the, for those who love me, who have been called according to my purpose. 
Not all things you go through will be good, but I promise I will work them out for your good. That's God's promise. So now that kind of brings us to the point where really all we have to do is trust God. What else is there? But to trust God. And that means no less than three things. To trust God means, number one, obeying God, whatever he says. I could tell this week in uh, eighth grade religion class with the, with the students, they, they were struggling with this one a little bit, trusting God in, in whatever he says. We were, we were studying God's word in the, the sixth commandment, do not commit adultery. And the light bulbs are just going on. Like, this is so radically different than every message they hear out there in the world, in the media, in the movies, and music, anywhere. And both in the words that some people were, were speaking and the questions they were asking and the expressions on their faces, some people where they were literally fighting back against what God's word has to say regarding marriage and divorce and sexuality and gender and love and all these things. Because they didn't want to submit to what God's word says. They wanted to define God's will according to their feelings. That's not just a temptation for eighth graders, is it? Middle school students. That's a temptation for all of us. But trusting God means obeying whatever his word says. The second part, though, trusting God also means to submit. Right? Submitting our will to whatever God's will is. The first part is obeying God in whatever he says. The second part is submitting in whatever he sends. In other words, whatever God allows into our lives, we need to trust that, that God does have a plan and purpose. We might not always see it now. But he has a plan and a purpose to use that to draw us closer to him, to depend on him, to find our strength in him, to grow in him, and finally even to glorify him through it. Uh, check it out. There's a, there's a small detail in our text, but listen to Jesus again. It's where he prays, okay, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. And then what happened next? Look what it says in verse 43. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. Okay, great. Right now we're talking. Divine strength. An angel shows up, so everything gets easier, right? All of his troubles just disappear. Poof. What comes next? And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. So even as Jesus submitted to God's will, things didn't get easier. They actually got harder. If you're Christian, what do you think will happen to you when you submit to God's will and you start to put your faith into practice? Don't expect that things will just get easier. It may, in fact, get harder. But do not despair. That does not mean that God has abandoned you. It just means depend on your Father who loves you. And he will strengthen you. And after the angel strengthened Jesus, he was able to pray more earnestly. He was able to face the challenge that was coming. And then finally, trusting God means believing that Jesus took away all your sins. Jesus saves you. From your sins. That's why Jesus prayed the prayer, not my will, Father, but yours be done. That's why Jesus backed up that prayer the very next day by going to the cross where he drank the cup of God's wrath all the way down to the very last drop. And that's why this story isn't really about our submission to God. It's first of all about his submission to his Father for us. We are forgiven because Jesus perfectly obeyed. Jesus perfectly submitted. Jesus perfectly trusted his heavenly Father. So let's wrap this up. 
right? We're talking about submitting to God. And that means putting, putting myself under his will. Let's be honest, that takes trust, doesn't it? And what works against that is, is fear, right? How can I know that the God of the universe isn't going to crush me for my sins, my iniquities, if I allow myself to fall into his hands? And friends, the answer to that question is because it was God's will to crush Jesus instead of you or me. And it was Jesus who accepted the cup and drank it down to the very bottom. So finally, anything that we go through in life, whatever it might be, how can we really know deep down that, that God is trustworthy, that he has my best interest in mind, even if I can't see how, even if I don't see how? It's because Jesus willingly took the punishment for all your sins. And so you can trust God in whatever he sends, even if the outcome isn't yet clear. You know the one who promises to strengthen you all the way to the very end. So you can embrace that prayer and make it your own. Not my will, Father, but yours be done. Amen. And may the peace of God that surpasses all our understanding guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus until we see him face to face in glory. Amen.